Um, firstly, thank you for those 10 people that randomly gave me coordinates between 0 and 5. A couple of things about these coordinates. Um, I've chosen 0 and 5 and 0 and 5, which I'll talk about the reason why I chose that in a minute. That's actually not the best choice. I started with something else, um, which has led to a bit of bias in our first coordinate, but I'll talk about that. Uh, but do notice that these are all whole number points. There is an element in your assignment that asks you to consider the merits of using whole number points compared to using not whole number points and decimal values. Um, so I'll leave that with you to consider. That's one of the more in-depth things that you need to take on yourself. But for now, I've asked you to generate randomised points between 0 and 5 and 0 and I'm calling this, I don't know, 5 there. My scale's a bit wonky, but that's all right. So what I'm basically doing is selecting coordinates inside that box. Now, what I want to do is estimate the area of this triangle. And I know that we, we can work out the area of the triangle fairly trivially. So this triangle has a height of 3 and a base of 5. So obviously the area of the triangle is equal to a half times 3 times 5, which is 7.5. So expecting you 7.5 units squared. The area of this rectangle that we're working in here, that has an area of 5 times 5, which is equal to 25. So the Monte Carlo method is based purely on the idea that if you randomly select a point in this rectangle, there is a 7.5 out of 25 chance of hitting a point inside the triangle. That's how the Monte Carlo work method works. But we reverse that because we, we don't want to talk about probabilities. We're going to reverse that around because we know the 25 because we picked the rectangle. What we don't know is this area. That's what we're trying to find. So instead of working out a probability of hitting this area, we're going to smash into that area, into this rectangle, a thousand points or a million points or something like that, and then use those points to determine an approximate area. So we're going to reverse that probability calculation. I'll show you how. So let's start with these coordinates, and I'll quickly plot them in purple. Um, so 2, comma 1 is um, somewhere, it's about here. I really should have done a better scale, but I didn't. No, it's probably not about there. Uh, 4, 3 is up here somewhere. 2, 5 is up here. Um, 1, 2 is about there. 0, 4 is about here. Uh, 0, 5 is up here. 2, 2 is about there. Uh, 1, 3 is about there. Um, we're up to 0, 5 is up here again, so I'll circle that to show there's two points there. And 4, 3 is also, is that a repeated point? It is, so I'll circle that. Okay, so you can see our coordinates, and I can see here that 1, 2, 3 of those randomised coordinates are in the triangle, which means 7 of them, 1, or actually I'll do this in a different colour. Welcome. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 are outside of our triangle. So what this suggests is that the triangle represents three-tenths of the area of the rectangle. And we've gotten really lucky here because if we determine the area based on that calculation, three of our coordinates, three of our randomised points are in the triangle out of 10, and the area of the rectangle is 25, and three-tenths of 25 is 7.5. Um, so we actually just predicted the area of the triangle at random, um, and we're really lucky. But there's a couple of considerations there. First of all, the larger I make this rectangle, the more points that will land outside of the triangle, and the less value those points will have. Basically, you want to make a rectangle that fits your area, but doesn't overdo it. And that's going to um, really help you. So you see there's um, stuff in your textbook, the Monte Carlo methods in your textbook. And there's stuff on the assignment that um, expect you to explain why and to choose the smallest possible rectangle. So consider why that's the case. Um, in this case, and now this is a really bad example, but, you know, that's the risk I took. In this case, we've got the exact area. But, you know, what? if you take 10 points, you're probably not going to get very close to the exact area. 10 points is a very small set of um, data. You really want to take 100 points or maybe 1,000 points. If you want to get an accurate area of the, the land that you're doing, then you're going to want to take as many points as possible. But there are also limitations, and keep in mind that's in your assignment as well. The limitations are that if you take 1,000 points, 
someone has to count how many of those points are inside the area and how many are outside the area. So you've got to make sure that you consider those limitations and you do it reasonably. Now, some of you might then automatically think, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to sacrifice a bit of time and do 10,000 points and get a really accurate area. That won't help you. Um, we'd like you to get a really accurate estimation, but actually what we care about more is that you just do something that's reasonable for a human to do and then discuss the limitations. That's the more important thing to us. Uh, what I'm going to show you now, though, is how you could use Desmos to help you and how you could use Excel to help you. Um, Excel is really helpful for a function, not so helpful for the last model. And then you'll have to adapt. Uh, so I'm going to just crack out in the cell. I, I started preparing stuff, but I didn't get very far this morning. So let's get an Excel document, and I'll show you a couple of extra formulas that will be helpful for you. Um, so first of all, you're going to want to generate a random set of data. Now, I asked you to give me a random set of data, and I said, in my random set of data, I said, can you give me two numbers between 0 and 5? And two people gave me the numbers 0 and 5. Straight away, that implies a little bit of bias on the way that I spoke, and there's some issues there. So you don't want your random set of the data just to be you making up numbers, because that will give you bias. Um, so you got to be careful of that. So Excel is going to be the best place. There are also random number generators online, um, and the merits of them all vary, but they'll all be good enough. So I'm just going to choose a set of X data and a set of Y data, and this is how I do the random sets of data. Um, and there's a couple of little nuanced things in here to help you. So first of all, if I just type in R-A-N-D, that returns a random number. I have to do open close brackets to make the function work. That returns a random number between 0 and 1. So you'll see there it's to um, six decimal points, and I think you can make it, it goes up to 10 or whatever it goes up to there. So there's a random number between 0 and 1. If I do something else over here, it'll change that number. Um, it just continues to randomize it as I go. You can play with that function if you want to. So I could drag that across to here, and I could get a whole bunch of random numbers. Right. So, um, so I could drag that down a bit. Whole bunch of random numbers between 0 and 1. But your rectangle might not be between 0 and 1. Your rectangle might instead be, um, so I might use this one because it's the one that I probably should have used on my triangle. That was 3, that was 5. So it might have a width of 5 and a height of 3. So I want random numbers between 3 and 5. So there are a couple of things you can do. Uh, first of all, Excel has this function as well. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, there we go. Has a rand between function. So that gives you a random number between. Brackets, the, the bottom is 0, the top is 3. Close brackets. And that gives me a random number between. Sorry, my, I should have brought my mouse up. Um, but you can see what happens here. And this is returning for me. On, oh, this is, my, my laptop's not working very well. I go this, way. Uh, this returns whole numbers. And we just talked about the fact whole numbers might actually cause you some issues. So I'd probably be avoiding higher numbers, but you do have to make that discussion in your assignment. So instead, what I could do is use the random number generator. Okay, there we go. Um, so this will generate a random number between 0 and 1. But if I do 5 times that random number, it will give me now a random number between 0 and 5 because I've just taken that 0 and 1 number and I've expanded it out by multiplying by 5. So that gives me the number that I want. And in the second one, in my Y values, I might choose to do 3 times. So it's just got 3 star, and I'll take out that RAND between, just make it RAND, and this will give me a number between 0 and 3. And then I can scroll this down. Now the last thing I'll say is that you might not have this situation. You might actually want your random numbers to be between, um, let's say your graph is here, you might want your random numbers between 1 and 8, and up to 5, say. So your rectangle is between 1 and 8 on the x-axis, and 0 and 5 on the y-axis. In this case, the width of your parabola is now 7, so you need your random numbers to have a span of 7. So I would put in here 
seven times rand, but then at the end, I don't want them to start at zero. I want them to start at one. So I'll just do a plus one. And that will generate random numbers between one and eight. Um, so it's about being a little bit clever about the choices that you make. Here, I, might, might, I want these to be between zero and five, like I said. So now I choose that and I scroll these down. Now, what I might just do is just give you a demonstration of this. Um, so I'll scroll it down a little bit more to say there. And I'll select all these random numbers. Oh, actually, and, and the titles. And once you've got these random numbers, I can insert scatter plot. And see, that's randomized between 1 and 8 and 0 and 5. Now, if I want to check to see how good that is, I can make something um, ridiculous. So if I choose these and scroll down to say um, 500 or whatever, my mouse isn't working, so I'm just pressing that down key, which is um, slow. Let's just go down to here. And then I select all this data and make a scatter plot of this data. You'll see that you can, you can actually see the edges because it will have picked random numbers within the zone. So you can really test it quite easily to make sure that you've got your um, graph right. So you can see here it's actually created that rectangle. But there's my random data. Now this is only 350 pieces of data and counting this would be a hassle. So you want your graph to be big, you want to be able to count it easily, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what's this function by the way just here? The parabola has a peak of 5, goes between 1 and 8. Let me know what that function is. Can we turn that on? So this is going back in time. Y equals, what is it, AX minus something squared plus something plus 5 because its turning point is at 5. What's this point here in the middle? So 4.5, so it's X minus 4.5. A has to be negative because it's an upside down parabola. It goes through 0, 1. So let's put 0, um, 1, so 1, 0 into here. And I get. 0 equals a times negative 3.5 squared plus 5. Um, what's negative 3.5 squared? 12.25? So it would be 5 over 12.25, which is 20 over 49. So a, does a equal negative 20 over 49? Yeah. So say that again. Uh, because I put in... This coordinate, which is 1, 0, and 1 minus 4.5 is 3.5. So anybody watching this video, I've just done some stuff. Um, but more importantly, I want to show how we could transfer this across to Desmos. Um, in the assignment, you get given that function, and I'm sure that you could determine that function if you needed to. So I'll just quickly get on to Desmos here and show you how we can sketch that function and then sketch the data. Doesn't like me today. Okay, so the function was y equals um, negative 20 over 49 and then x minus 4.5, close brackets, squared, plus 5. So there's my function. It goes between 1, 0 and 8, 0 and has a peak at 4.55. So that's how it looks. And now if I go back to here, sketching the function itself on um, on Excel is quite tricky and hard to follow, but Desmos steps in here and is really good. So if I select all this data, and I can select a lot of data, so I could do a thousand points. Um, but if I select this data, then I can. So what? Are, how many points have I got here? Oh, got more than I thought. Oh, there we go. I've got 374 points. I copy that, and then if I go back to here, um, I can not do that. I can add a table and I can paste that data in the table. And there it is there. So now I can see this data on my graph and I can zoom in a little bit. And if I needed to, I could do some counting on that. Okay, now what I've pre-prepared 
is this. I'm going to talk about this, and I'm going to talk about how you can use a spreadsheet for a function. So I've said, imagine if we actually wanted to find the area of the block of land that our colleague had got. So I've taken this from Google. I threw this earlier, and then I got stuck with a couple other things and ran out of time. But what I have done is you'll see down here, that's the scale from Google Maps. So whatever it is that you've got. My scale is, has 100 meters on Google Maps. So I have spread that image out to line this 100 meters up with my axes and make it equal to 100 units on my axes. Now, there's no reason why you couldn't make it equal to 10 units and then do some sort of area scaling later on. That's fine. Or even one unit, whatever works for you. I've made it 100 units. And at the point where I stopped doing this, I was just playing with dragging the college around so that it um, met there. And where's the base of the college? I'm going to let this go down there. So I'm now saying that the college grounds go between that, that's the side corner, and that's on my y-axis. This is the further south corner on my x-axis. And I can see the widest point is just here on Abraham Road at about 512. I want to make the smallest possible rectangle for my data. So I know the college is 500 metres wide. And it goes from zero up to here, which is a bit over 600, 620. Is it 512? No, it's 500 and, um, I've got 540. So I'm going to go 500, 0 to 540, and then 0 to 620, and then I'm going to plot that data on this graph. So I'm just going to quickly do this, and I'll do it for 100 data points. Uh, there we go. So I'll do it over here. Um, XX1, YY1, just as a label to be a bit different. So we do um, 0 to 540 and 0 to 620, wasn't it? So let's do 540 times random. Um, number there, and then let's do 620 times random number there, and then let's scroll that down so I get 100 points. So I have to get down to 101, and you, you'll probably want to use nice round, round numbers, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, there's my 101 points. I copy that, randomly generated points, and I go into here and I paste that. There's my data, there's my points, and now I can go through and count the ones that are inside the college ground. So I'll say that's not, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I know the area of the rectangle I used, 540 times 620, and then I can work out what percentage of points landed in the college grounds, and I can work out the overall proportion from that. Is that all right with everybody? Um, a, couple, a couple of little things. I know that about half of you are just sitting working on your computers, and that's your choice, and I'm hoping that you won't come back and expect me to reteach you this. Um, but for those of you who are, I'd, I'd just like to tell you a couple of things now and make sure you understand them. Firstly, you'll note here, this can be quite frustrating, and people do find it frustrating each year, that when I, you'll collect a set of data and you'll do some stuff with that data, but if you don't copy that data before you do stuff with it, if I do anything to the spreadsheet now, my random numbers completely change. And people, in the past, people have done stuff with their data and then done something with the spreadsheet and lost their data and they don't have a copy of it. And then all the stuff they did, they have to redo. So my suggestion to you is once you've collected data, you'll notice mine's on, mine I've just copied to put in Desmos, so it's on my clipboard at the moment. Put it somewhere else in a new spreadsheet by right clipping. Oh, no, it's not on my clipboard anymore. So, so... Select the data, I'll select, say, this much, and then paste. But if you go to the second paste option, that's paste values, not paste formula, but paste values. And now, whilst this set of data here is a set of numbers based on a formula, this set of data is a set of values. And so if I go across here and change the spreadsheet, you'll, say that you'll see that these ones change, but these ones don't. And so now I've saved those values. So I suggest as soon as you've said you've got your random numbers that you want to work with, then copy paste them to a spot and keep the values. You can ask me that if you want to. That's the first thing. Just, it's just how the random number generator works. Yeah. It just re-randomizes every time. It actually means if you if you did something and somebody will do it because people are crazy, if you do like a million numbers. 
then it will actually probably your computer will stall for a second every time you put something in there because there'd be so much randomized data. Yeah. If you put it in another sheet, I think it's just when you make a change to this. So any change, like you saw there, I was just putting, I was just typing the letter T into a cell. Any change to that, it'll change it. And you can see what happens to my graph. This is where people get most frustrated. They've just counted stuff on a graph, and bam, the graph changed. It's just the way the formula works. So the formula works. It Basically what a spreadsheet does is every time you change a spreadsheet, the formulas recalculate for all formulas. You just don't normally notice it because if you, your formula is average, and you haven't changed the numbers, the formula doesn't look like it changed, but it has recalculated. So it assumes that you might be changing something in one of the formulas, and so it recalculates everything. Yeah, so then the random number one will just recalculate the random number. Okay, so just be wary of that. Um, okay, lastly, here's my original set of data. If you're dealing with a function, you can set up a process within um, this spreadsheet to do the counting for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get 100 of these data points and I'm going to copy them across, again, using that method we just said, by keeping the data points so that we don't lose them. So I've highlighted and copied, and now I'm going to do the paste values here. Okay, so there's my values. That won't change. And I'm going to give them a title again. Um, my spreadsheet is quite messy now, you'll note, so hopefully you'll make yours a bit neater. Um, and I'm going to just make a, and I've got a column here, and this will be, this is what people have used in the past, so it doesn't really matter what you call it, but most people seem to have been stuck on this hit miss idea. So what we're going to do is determine if this is inside <coughs> this parabola. Remember we've got these numbers to work on this parabola. So what we want to know is for this x value, is that y value above or below the line? If it's below, that's a hit. If it's above, it's a miss. So I'm going to calculate, I'm going to determine a formula to see if this works. So my formula is going to be, it always starts with an equals because it's a formula. So you have to start with an equals. And I want to know that if I substitute in um, that value there into my parabola, so keep in mind, um, so I might just delete that value. My parabola is um, so it's an if formula, and I'll explain that in a second, but my parabola is um, 40, 20, no, negative, so I'll put that in brackets just to make sure it works, negative 20 over 49, close brackets, times, open brackets, and this is D2, so that's calling my X value, um, minus 4.5, close brackets, squared. Remember, we do our squared by doing the hat symbol, 2. And then I've got a plus 5 on the end, plus 5. And I've substituted that point in. That will give me the curve for that x value. So the curve point. I want to know, is my y point below the curve point or is it above the curve point? So my curve point is, um, I've just substituted in, what's that first number? 7.82, which is right over here. So the curve point will be about here. I want to know, is the randomized Y value 1.72, is that below or is it above? If it's below, it's inside my function. If it's above, it's outside my function. That's what I want to know. So I'm going to test that um, and say, is it below? And the value is E2, that's my Y value. And if it is below that, that means my y value is above, then I want it to return miss. And if it's above it, I want it to return hit. Now, I might have this wrong. I might have to use speech marks. I'm not 100% sure. Let's just check. Um, I think I do have to use speech marks in here. So I want it to return miss or hit. So the first one is a miss. But now I can drag that formula down all the way down to 100, and it will tell me which ones were hits and which ones were misses. So remember that calculation that's going on in there. The spreadsheet is determining for you what the curve point is for that x value, and then is that above or below the y value. 
you can flip this around and say, is the Y value above or below the curve value? You can write it in lots of different ways. Um, and it will feed back to me a hit or a miss. And then what I can say, I'll just delete this and this one. Um, what I can say then is I can do a count if function. So inside this function, I did what's called an if function. So if this thing is less than E2, then return miss, otherwise return hit. Then I'm going to do a count if function here. I'm going to say equals count if. It's, it's basically the English language applies here. So count if just counts what's in there. I want to count if first my range of values. So I want to count my F column, all of these data points here. So I'm going to highlight them all. If you have a mouse that's working, which I don't have, you could always just use that. And I want to count if they are hits. So I'm going to type in here. I'll just go back up to the top. I'm typing in there. Speech bubble hit, close bracket, and it's going to tell me that 66 of them hit. I had 100 data points, 66 of them hit. That's telling me that 66 out of 100 data points are under the curve. That means by Monte Carlo method we can work out an estimation. Um, and I'll just quickly go back to here. I might just screenshot all of this. doesn't have the um, values, but I'm making a video of this so you can get them from there. But if I just screenshot this, uh, and take this back here, I'll do the final calculations with you, and we might even do an integration just to check our value. So if anyone wants to integrate that area while I'm quietly doing this, you're welcome to. And tell me again. But basically, this is saying that the proportion is 66 out of 100 its means that the area under the curve equals 66 over 100 times the area of the rectangle. And the area of the rectangle, remember, went from 1 to 8, so 7 by 5. So the area under the curve should be 66 over 100 times 7 times 5. And what's that equal to? Anybody can calculate that want to do that for me? Flat. That's cool. I'll go on. That's working. Uh, what's it? Six, 0 0.66 times 7 times 5. So it's saying 23.1. It is an approximation method. It's based on probabilities. 100 data points is good, but it's not perfect. And every time we change that spreadsheet, we've got a different set of random numbers. So it could change. Um, but you'll notice here that if I actually calculate the integral of that function there, which I might just expand out because it's going to be a bit of a pain, so negative 20 on 49, um, x minus 4.5 squared plus 5, and dx, so it's not the nicest function. I want to do the integral between 8 and 1. In fact, you know what I'll do? Forget that. We'll use, um, yeah, we'll use technology, and I think I've already got it typed into Desmos, so I did. So, did I? There it is there. So, in Desmos, I can do nothing because my mouse is not working. There we go. I can copy that, and if I type in the Desmos INT, it gives me an integral. I can do it between 8 and 1 of the function. I have to put brackets around the entire function, no, not the entire integral but around the entire function, otherwise it, it doesn't like it, and then do dx. Remember, we're hoping to get about 23.1, 23.33. So it's not perfect. Um, just to take this a step further, if I took that formula, hopefully it will copy well, and put it onto my actual random numbers, um, there, then you'll see, and I can drag that down. So that's gone right down to 350 data points. So this is doing it for my random number sets. And I can do my count if function here again, but this time I'm going to do it for column C. I'm just making a quick change, and you can watch this on the video if you'd like to. Um, but we're right down to 300 and something, 375, I believe. So it's going to count all my hits in this column now. But every time I change the spreadsheet, that column will change. And so you can see 252 hits in the first case. That as, a, as the area 
remember our error calculation was equal to um, this value divided by 374. That's come from the fact that I have 374 hit and miss data points. Uh, and then that, I'm going to put that in brackets just to make sure it works. Times 7 times 5, that was our area of the rectangle. And so it's approximated 23.21208. Uh, That's pretty close to our 23 and a third we expected. But if I change my data now, now it's approximated 23.77. Change it again, approximated 22.55. So you can see you, you can build in your spreadsheet a really robust approximation machine. And it's actually quite good that the random numbers change every time because then you can get data really quick. Um, the last thing I'll say, and again, one more point before that everybody should listen to. If you think it's a good idea to do 100 data points five times and then average the results, I'm going to tell you right now that that is exactly the same as doing 500 data points once, and you probably just wasted time. Um, so just, just be mindful of that, because if you do something like that, that's actually just you generating data repeatedly, which could be more easily done just once, you're actually not showing that you understand what you're doing, and that can detriment what's um, your overall probably modelling grade. So just keep that in mind. Um, there is a benefit, though, to doing that. You could do 100 data points 10 times, and then you could work out the standard deviation of your 10 results and talk about how to spread out your results, which will then tell you um, whether they are predictable and therefore whether they're good results and the accuracy. So you could, there is a benefit to it, but it's only useful to do it if you actually apply that benefit. Something to think about. Are there any questions? 30 minutes. <laughs>